UN Human Rights Council SAD event. Of the borders, which has made 10 accounts provide invaluable insight into. It also found a disturbing array of crimes against humanity. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Noah Lee, and I will be serving as your moderator for today's seminar. This side event, Revisiting Human Rights in the DPRK in anticipation of the Universal Periodic Review, is organized by People for Co Successful Korean Reunification, Hambyon, Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, Sunny Pictures, 10 Million Divided Korean Families Association, Transitional Justice Working Group, Han Voice, and North Korean Human Rights Corporation. The objective of this side event is to shed light on the grave violations of human rights in cases of forced repatriation of North Korean escapees by China and the inhumane treatment of persons with disabilities within the DPRK. Prior to the commencement of our session, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that this session will be recorded. I assure you that the recording will be conducted with the utmost consideration for the privacy of our esteemed audience members and that their faces will remain anonymous. We would also like to express our appreciation for our distinguished panelists and speakers who are here today to shed light on this critical issue. Now, I would like to introduce Mr. Taehoon Kim, President of Peace Corps and North Korean Human Rights Corporation, and Honorary Chairman of Hanbyon to deliver the opening address of today's seminar. Good morning, I am Taehoon Kim. Today, Monday, is a special day. 10 years ago, Monday, 17th March 2014, the UN Commission of Inquiry, COI, on Human Rights in North Korea, released its historic report to the 25th session of the UN Human Rights Council. You are happy and honored to hold the 55th UN Human Rights Council SAD event on this meaningful day. I'd like to thank all of you for braving the rainy weather to be here, and especially honorable UN Special Reporter Elizabeth Sermon and the honorable Ambassador Lee and the Honorable Special Envoy Julie Turner for being here at such short notice. The CY report dramatically raised the world's attention to human rights in North Korea. However, North Korea has not accepted the CY report and continues to suppress its people and to divert all of its resources to nuclear weapons, leaving its people starving. In recent years, North Korea's repeated nuclear tests have led to systematic evidence that people living near test sites are being exposed to radiation and suffering serious human casualties. By the way, on the surface, North Korea claims to have made some improvements for vulnerable groups, such as women and people with disabilities but it has only improved its image in the eyes of the international community to ease human rights abuses. We have a woman with a disability from North Korea, Mrs. Mi Young Ni, who is here today to testify to this point. It will be forced UN testimony as a person with a disability from North Korea. The human rights situation in North Korea has worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic with the authorities' restrictions on movement, border closures, and the blockages of ideas and culture exacerbating the suffering of North Koreans. Next, I'd like to urge North Korea's neighbors, China and Russia, to uphold the principle of non refoulement most notably in October last year. China sent an unprecedented 600 escapees back to North, North Korea and has refused to stop the Polish despite warnings from the international community. This is a serious violation of the Refugee Convention and the Convention Against Torture, to which China is also a party. 
China claims that there is no evidence that repatriated escapees have been tortured in North Korea. But there are so many victims who can testify that they were forcibly repatriated from China and tortured. One of them, Mrs. Myung, uh, Myung Lee, Myung Hee Ji, uh, will testify here soon. Therefore, the upcoming Human Rights Council resolution should explicitly name China as the perpetrator of forced repatriation and shame it for its wrongdoing. This is the way to ensure the proper implementation of the CY report. Most important than consensus is clarity on who is responsible for refoulement to prevent recurrence. Meanwhile, North Korea has been helping Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine by providing shells and missiles, and Russia in turn is illegally hosting North Korean workers in harsh conditions, transferring weapons technology to North Korea. And furthermore, Russia has been arresting and holding for an extended period of time a South Korean missionary who was helping North Korean escapees and loggers on espionage charges, allegedly at the request of North Korea. Finally, liberal countries should be more active in, support, in supporting Ukraine as it control, confronts Putin with all its might. In this light, we commemorate Alexei Navalny, who died on 16th February in a Siberian prison while fighting for democracy and human rights in Russia. And we strongly demand that the EPRK urgent dismantling of the North Korean political prison camps and the release of political prisoners. The international community must not forget the world's longest and worst human rights crisis in North Korea and to do all it can to address it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Taehoon Kim, for your opening remarks. Moving on to our first main speaker, we would like to welcome Ms. Elizabeth Salmon, Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in the DPRK, to deliver a statement on the current state of human rights in North Korea. Well, good morning. Allow me to congratulate you in the first place for the initiative of organizing this side event. I am grateful for the occasion to make a few opening remarks, bringing to this conversation the perspective of my mandate, which is focused, as you know, both in accountability and in seeking the first case collaboration and compliance with human rights standards and with its international obligations. On accountability, it is important to acknowledge that in the last decade since the COI report, many efforts have been made by a wide array of actors to ensure accountability for human rights violation committed by the DPRK, including civil litigation brought to domestic courts by some actors. Many victims have shared their stories with the UN, governments, and civil society organizations so that human rights violations can be documented. Some are pursuing memorialization in different forms. I particularly commend courageous efforts that have been made by victims and their families supported by civil society organizations. By stressing this, I wish to call your attention to the multiplying effects of the actions conducted by institutional actors when there is a civil society ready and committed to follow up on their findings and or recommendations. The UN human rights mechanisms, including my mandate, have been serving both as part of accountability measures and entry point for engagements through dialogue with the states, providing advice and handling individual cases. It is important in this regard to remind ourselves that the DPRK is so far willing to report to treaty bodies 
actively participates in the UPR, Universal Periodic Review, and does not close the door entirely to special procedures. For example, the DPRK officially invited a special rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities in 2017. The special rapporteur, Catalina de Vandas, made important recommendations, for instance, that the government should not only develop laws and policy, but also use laws and devise and implement plans to effectively change the reality of persons living with disabilities. She also recommended that the government should make sure people with disabilities are included in decision-making processes, education, work, and services. In the aftermath of this visit, DPRK continues to engage with the UN human rights mechanism, mechanisms on the issues of the rights of persons living with disabilities. The government submitted a response to the list of issues raised by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in December 2023. Concerning repatriation, one of the strengths of the special procedures is that we can also engage with other states related to DPRK human rights issues independently. This includes communications, dialogues, and official country missions. For instance, my mandate and other mandate holders as well has been a strong voice on raising concerns about forcible repatriation of individuals from the DPRK and clarifying legal obligations to China and other states. I receive information that China, regrettably, continues to forcibly repatriate people from the DPRK. But dialogue led to a small progress in understanding legal obligations. Equally concerning is the stricter control of the borders, which has made SKP and transfer of information very challenging. People used to escape from the country as a last resource but now it is almost impossible. We, the international community, should continue to talk about how to address this issue because, as it has been seen in other cases, the lack of information could easily turn into the lack of interest. We cannot abandon the people in the DPRK who are suffering from human rights violations. Finally, it is even more important to make best use of limited engagement opportunities with the DPRK, such as the upcoming UPR in November and the review by the Committee on the Rights of Persons Living with Disabilities. As you may know, many of the recommendations the DPRK received during the third round UPR session in 2019 overlap with those presented during the DPRK's second UPR in 2014 as the DPRK government had failed to show noticeable improvements. Not many actors are, in fact, following up on the implementation of such recommendations, while, once again, the scarcity of information remains a major challenge. Therefore, I hope that we work together to follow up on specific issues, such as right to food, the right to health, the treatment of repatriated people and the specific aspects of the rights of women and girls and the rights of persons with disabilities in the upcoming UPR. I also hope that the DPRK will take the opportunity of the UPR to restart engagement with the international community, including through the presence, allowing the presence of the UN country team. I am looking forward to listening to the other panelists, particularly the two escapees from the DPRK, to whom I wish to express our unfailing support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Special Rapporteur Salmon, for your statement. Now, we would like to welcome Xinhua Li, Ambassador for International Cooperation on North Korean Human Rights, Republic of Korea, to address the critical measures necessary to reach consensus on the issue of North Korean human rights. Ambassador Lee, the floor Thank is you yours. Very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. 
As we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the COI report and the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the UN Special Rapporteur um, on Human Rights North Korea, it is my pleasure to speak at this event organized by the Peace Corps and the Association of the North Korean Human Rights. Today, we have the honor of hosting two North Korean escapees, uh, particularly including one uh, who suffered from discrimination due to disabilities. Their first-hand accounts provide invaluable insight into the human rights situation in North Korea today, I believe. The COI report of 2014 indeed represented a watershed moment directing international focus toward the human rights abuses in North Korea. It underscored the importance of considering the nuclear issue within the wider context of security and peace. The resumption of discussion on North Korean human rights at the UN Security Council in August 2023, following a six-year hiatus, is both a warning to the regime and a beacon of hope for the people of North Korea. Post-publication of the COI report, North Korea's response included amend amendments to the Child Rights Act in 2014 and ratification of the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disability, CRPD, in 2016. These actions seem to be a direct response to the international pressure mounted by the COI report. However, this momentum was unfortunately undermined by a shift in political priority in South Korea and the United States between 2017 to 2019, with a focus on more inter-Korean relations and denuclearization talks. This led to human rights being sidelined. Those period, marked by false hopes for peace and denuclearization talks, saw so North Korean human rights issue being overshadowed. This year, marks a pivotal moment for emphasized human rights issue in North Korea. It coincided with, as I mentioned earlier, the 10th anniversary of the COI report publication and upcoming Universal Periodic Review, UPR, of North Korea by the United Nations in November. The UPR, established by the UN General Assembly Resolution in March 26 and first implemented in 2008, is a crucial element of the UN Human Rights Council. It conducted a comprehensive review of the human rights situation in all 19, 193 UN member states approximately every four, year and a half years, four and a half years. This process offers a new opportunity to represent the voice of North Korean citizens. The North Korea's first UPR review took place in December 2009. Following the pressure from the COI activity in 2013 to 14, the North Korea submitted its national report of the first UPR in 2014. During the second UPR, North Korea accepted 114 recommendations and partially accepted three, indicating initial willingness to engage with international human rights standards. However, the third UPR period, overlapping with the COVID-19 pandemic, revealed a significant backslide in overall conditions, including civil and political rights. According to a report by a reading NGO from 2019 to uh, 2023, North Korea claimed to embrace UN recommendations to enhance the rights of women and persons with disabilities. But meaningful changes for North Korean citizens remain very elusive. Similarly, policies for enhancing the rights of persons with disability have been inadequate. North Korea responded to the UN Committee on the Right of Persons with Disabilities CRPD's list of issues sent last year. North Korea addressed all 30 questions, including modifying uh, derogatory language towards persons with disability in laws, policy for disabled women and children in rural and remote areas, and plans to ratify the optional protocol allowing individuals to file complaints directly with the CRPD. Despite these claims, such initiatives seem to lack tangible impact, as evidenced by the low awareness of disability rights among North Koreans. The active participation of a North Korean defector, Ms. Im Young, Kim, in today's panel, providing her testimony is thus highly significant and appreciated. The key issue is the actual implementation of this policy in North Korea. Attention is focused on whether North Korea will ratify the optional protocol allowing the CRPD to conduct direct investigation in case of several violations. Typically, NGOs within a country or raise issues for the committee's consideration. But due to the absence of fun, uh, functioning NGOs in North Korea at all, organizations based in South Korea often undertake this role. It remains to be seen whether North Korea has a genuine intention to ratify and implement the optional protocol. 
international concern is escalating over the human rights issues of North Korean defectors in China as well. That must be addressed in North Korea Universal Periodic Review UPR this November. Despite global awareness of the plight, as the lawyer Kim has mentioned as well, around 600 defectors of forced military petrol last October, continuing a tragic pattern. The situation is particularly harrowing for North Korean women in China, who often face two grim choice, choices. Number one, avoiding human trafficking by uh, securing a job through connection, or number two, lacking such networks risk being trafficked or repatriated when caught by authorities. Many end up traf trafficked or enforced marriages, suffering sexual exploitation and threat of repatriation by their Chinese husband or brokers. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAOC, though, expressed concern in May last year that China has become a destination for trafficking North Korean women and girls for sexual exploitation and forced marriages. These circumstances, including human trafficking, forced marriage, and threat of repatriation, amount to crimes against humanity, necessitating urgent international action and attention. Furthermore, the suffering endured by defectors repatriated to North Korea is profound. Women stand back face imprisonment, abuse, sexual violence, and even incarceration in political prison camp, a flagrant violation of basic human rights. The emotional trauma is immensable as well, particularly for those women or mothers separate from their children in China, and their children who, have, who are Chinese citizens also, also suffer in turn. Forced family separation is also a grave violation of international human, law, human rights law. Last year, the South Korean ambassador to the UN in Geneva urged China to protect the right of North Korean defector and comply with international regulation. This marked the first time the South Korean government directly addressed defector right in China's UPR. The South Korean government has since, here, has since cleared China's position on the defector issue ahead of the fourth Chinese UPR, including question on refugee application process, protection, support for trafficked North Korean, and support for children of defectors born in China. The human rights crisis in North Korea transcends national boundaries, affecting not just North Korea but also those who have escaped the regime. These defectors face serious problems, as I mentioned, the human trafficking and forced repatriation. We must uh, uh, raise those issues. The Kim regime also perpetrated abduction and detection uh, crimes by individuals, not only South Korean but also foreign nationals. And I also want to mention the uh, Kim Gukki, Che Chunggil, Kim Jong Sam, who's been detained uh, together with the three other uh, the North Korean defector who are there in North Korea for more than 10 years. I think Kim Jong Un must release them immediately. And all those things are, I think, a very serious humanitarian crisis. But unfortunately, they turn out to be the focus in crisis because of those uh, mounting uh, the global crisis that has a more global attention, such as Ukraine and the Kaja crisis. Currently attending a UN conference in Geneva myself, I'm firmly convinced of the UN's critical role in promoting human rights in North Korea, including the Elizabeth Salmon. North Korea's self-imposed isolation and close-off nature mark make conventional method of enhancing and protecting human rights typically effective in most UN member countries in applicable. Despite North Korea's claim that human rights issues are being exploited by the US and its allies as part of a hostile policy, the majority of nations within the the United Nations expressed their concern and support actions to address these human rights violations. The significance of the UN's presence on North Korean human rights issues is underscored by North Korea's desire to maintain its UN membership status. In this context, the role of the UN and European nations becomes increasingly vital. It is essential to foster collaboration and enhance multilateral cooperation with nations, sharing the value of liberal democracy, while also engaging in dialogue and building relations with the country holding different perspectives, including swing states and those with neutral stances. Even these countries agree that acts violating universal values and norms, such as human rights abuses of North Korea, warrant concern and demand resolution. This consensus is why UN resolution on North Korean human rights have been continuously adopted over the past two decades. I advocate for, quote unquote, hybrid multilateralism. I argue that this strategy prioritizes collaborations and conflict resolution among a diverse range of stakeholders. This approach is particularly relevant in regions like the Indo-Pacific, where intricate political, economic, and cultural complexity exists. 
Such engagement is crucial for contributing to regional peace and development. The effort of countries that share the values of freedom, democracy, and human rights are pivotal in this process. I emphasize to the risk and diplomat at the UN that European nations are often at the forefront of addressing risk and human rights issues. I urge European countries, along with allies like South Korea and the US and Japan, can make even more aggressive and challenge some uh, resolution uh, that can uh, pressure the North Korea for the upcoming uh, UN resolutions on North Korean human rights, hopefully, to continue to expand their life and, and also to expand their dialogue and engagement with swing state. By strengthening multilateral cooperation, these like-minded nations can develop innovative solutions to improve human rights in North Korea, demonstrating the significant impact of international unity and concerted efforts. To conclude, I want to tell you that I don't know and we do not know what is the motive of Kim Jong-un regime uh, to uh, propose the two, or argue or claim the two separate hostile uh, state narratives that targeting the South Korea as a hostile country. No matter what it was, I do believe we Korea, two Koreans, South Koreans, North Korean people are not anybody and we, Department of Korea and South Korean government, will continuously work hard for peace, united uh, North Korea, the Korean Peninsula. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Lee, for your invaluable insights. We truly hope that this platform will serve as a catalyst to improve North Korean human rights in the future. Next, we would like to welcome Julie Turner, the U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues, to deliver a statement on the role of the international community in standing with the North Korean people. Thank you. Um, thank you to Mr. Kim and Peace Corps for hosting today's important side event. And thank you to Special Rapporteur Salmon and Ambassador Lee for your remarks, which created an important framing for today's conversation. I'm also honored to be speaking today along with Ms. Lee and Ms. G. Um, thank you both for being willing to share your deeply personal stories with us today. Your testimonies will provide us with important insights into the situation for persons with disabilities in the DPRK and the treatment of individuals who are forcibly repatriated to North Korea. I, along with the other governments and international organization representatives here today, will take your appeals and recommendations on board and will seek to integrate them into our efforts to promote human rights in North Korea. Thank you for your courage in speaking out and shining a spotlight on the abuses and violations committed in North Korea. Ten years ago, the UN Commission of Inquiry on the Human Rights Situation in the DPRK completed its work and released a comprehensive report documenting what it labeled systematic, widespread, and grave human rights violations occurring in the DPRK. The chair of the Commission of Inquiry, Justice Michael Kirby, stated, it also found a disturbing array of crimes against humanity. These crimes are committed against inmates of political and other prison camps, against starving populations, against religious believers, against persons who try to flee the country, including those forcibly repatriated to China. Today, we remain deeply concerned by reports of forced repatriations to the DPRK and continue to call on all member states, including the PRC, and Russia to abide by the principle of non refoulement The COI's final report included extensive findings regarding the treatment of individuals forcibly repatriated to the DPRK, including accounts of torture, sexual and gender-based violence, forced abortions, imprisonment, and in some cases, summary execution. In addition, more recent reports, including one released earlier this month by Human Rights Watch, extensively documented de deteriorating conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic, including a shoot-to-kill policy at the border. There is no relief to be found, even 10 years after the COI report, for North Koreans seeking protection. As we will hear from the escapees who testify this morning, the situation for North Korean refugees and asylum seekers is dire. The international community must act now to promote 
accountability for those responsible for widespread human rights violations and abuses being committed in the DPRK, and to take action to provide protection for those seeking it. The PRC should allow UNHCR to have access to North Koreans seeking protection to assess their protection needs. Governments should also take action to press the DPRK to integrate repatriated individuals in a manner consistent with its international commitments. We call on the DPRK to account for the whereabouts and well-being of the repatriated refugees, including Kim Chol ok and the other North Koreans repatriated last year. The DPRK's repressive policies have for decades unnecessarily separated families. This separation has impacted countless individuals ranging from wartime divided families, and we saw the video before the event started um, showing some of the impacted individuals in that category, abductees, POWs, detainees, and refugees. For many impacted, there is a sense of urgency due to their advanced age, but for all impacted individuals, one day of separation forced on them by the DPRK government is a day too long to be de denied contact with their loved ones. The United States will continue to prioritize the reunification of families in our efforts to promote human rights in the DPRK. To that end, I want to reaffirm that the United States stands ready to engage in a conversation with North Korea on human rights. We are ready to engage in a frank and outcome-oriented conversation, including by discussing our own efforts to promote and protect human rights in the United States. One of the witnesses this morning will address her experiences in the DPRK as a person with a disability. I'm impressed by Ms. Lee's courage and amazed by how she was able to overcome so many obstacles set in her path growing up in the DPRK. She did not let those obstacles stop her, and is a shining example of why investing in accessibility and inclusion for persons with disabilities is also an investment in economic growth and peace and security. As a signatory of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities since 2016, the DPRK has taken steps to cooperate with international mechanisms, including hosting the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in May of 2017 and in supporting many of the disability rights related recommendations by governments during the DPRK's third cycle universal periodic review. The government has some laws in place that support inclusion of persons with disabilities, including a new one passed by the Supreme People's Assembly last September. But more progress could and must be made to address societal discrimination and also to increase domestic education and awareness of disability rights. Further actions are needed to ensure that children with disabilities are able to access education, to eliminate physical barriers in public spaces, to allow persons with disabilities to participate more widely in society, and to improve access to services including healthcare and to end discrimination in employment. The United States engages with many countries to advance the rights of persons with disabilities and we remain willing to work with the DPRK to realize its commitments under uh, these international treaty bodies. In the last year, our special advisor on international disability rights, Sara Mankara, launched a new dialogue on the rights of persons with disabilities with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. She engages in similar dialogues with a range of governments throughout the Indo-Pacific and around the world. One of our recommendation, one of the recommendations that Indonesia offered to the DPRK during its third cycle um, universal periodic review was to increase collaboration between the National Committee for Persons with Disabilities in the DPRK and relevant national institutions in other member states. I urge other governments to consider channels through which national institutions can establish such connections to corresponding institutions in the DPRK who might be able to carry forward advocacy and awareness raising work to advance the rights of persons with disabilities. As we look toward the DPRK's fourth cycle UPR this fall, the US urges the DPRK to allow independent organizations and institutions to engage directly in the process and to submit stakeholder reports. We urge the DPRK to, steps, to take steps to implement many of the actions it supported in its third cycle. The United States is committed to supporting the welfare of the North Korean people and will continue to advocate for concrete change and will continue to press for respect for human rights in North Korea. 
In doing so, we again reaffirm our willingness to engage in a conversation on human rights. In closing, I want to reiterate something that I've said many times, that now is the time for action. We cannot become complacent. The human rights crises in the DPRK remains one of the most protracted crises in the world. We must take action now to promote real change that benefits the people of North Korea and improves respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Turner, for your contribution. We would now like to invite the two North Korean escapees, Mi Young Lee and Myung Hee Ji, to provide us with first-hand testimonies on forced repatriation and discrimination based on disability. Mi Young Lee made the perilous journey to freedom with her husband and daughter in June of 2018 by crossing the Aplok River on her husband's back. Please welcome her to the floor. Anyongaseo 제가 7살, 8살 되어 학교에 입학하게 되었을 때 저희 부모님들은 통학이 힘들다는 이유로 저를 학교에 보내지 않았습니다. 그 70년대 그때 당시에는 장애인들이 학교에 안 가는 것이 사회의 풍조가 되었기 때문에 당연히 저는 학교에 못 가는 것을 저희 운명으로 받아들이려고 받아들이려고 하였습니다. 그런데 제가 아홉 살 되던 해 저를 다시 맡게 맡게 되었던 담임 선생님이 덕분으로 저는 학교에 다니게 되었습니다. 저를 맡은 담임 선생님이 저희 부모님들한테 다리를 못 쓸수록 배워야 된다고 부모님을 위해 시켰고 부모님들은 저를 배워주기 위해서 업고 한 시간이 되는 거리를 업고 다녔습니다. 초등학교를 졸업한 후 저는 대학에 가게 해서 열심히 공부하였습니다. 그런데 어느 날인가 담임 선생님이 저에게 대학은 사람들 앞에서 대중을 이끌어야 하는 간부가 되는 길이기 때문에 장애인은 대학에 갈수 없다고 저를 대학에 못 간다고 하였습니다. 저는 그때 정말 많이 좌절하였습니다. 그래서 저는 초등학교를 졸업하고 고등학교까지만 다니게 되었습니다. 고등학교를 졸업하고 저는 집에서 그냥 놀게만 되었습니다. 유년 시절부터 타인에게 모욕을 많이 당하였기 때문에 부모님들은 저를 바깥에 나가지 말라고 하였고 성인이 되어서는 사람들이 시전이 두려워 전 바깥에 나가지 않고 집에서 그냥 보냈습니다. 제가 집에만 있으면서 1년 365일 고립된 날을 보낸다고 생각해 볼때 그것이 얼마나 힘든지 아마 다 여러분들은 모를 것입니다. 북한에서는 엘리베이터나 도로가 잘 되어 있지 않기 때문에 장애인들은 밖에 나갈 일도 없고 할 일도 없기 때문에 바깥에 나가려고 하지 않습니다. 혹시 바깥에 나갈 일이 있으면 모든 사람들이 저를 쳐다보기 때문에 진짜로 저 바깥에 나가는 거 싫어했거든요. 사람들이 아마 장애인을 처음 봐서 그렇게 많이 시선을 집중하였던 것 같습니다. 북한에서는 저와 같은 중증 장애인들은 전혀 일할 수 없습니다. 경증 장애인들은 경로동 직장이란 게 있어서 그들은 거기에 가서 일할 수 있었거든요. 근데 그들이 하루 일하는 시간은 제가 알기에는 다섯 시간으로 일한다고 알고 있었습니다. 근데 그들이 직장에 이렇게 다녀도 월 봉급이란 건 받지 못하고 그냥 일하는 것만 알고 있었습니다. 저는 집에서 그냥 학교를 졸업하고 놀다가 그냥 있을 수는 없지 않아요. 배운 것이 있는데 그래서 다른 사람들과 같이 동등하게 살수 있으면 나는 어떻게 해야 되지 하고 생각하다가 저 독학으로 미승을 배웠습니다. 저 미승을 배워서 엄청 잘하는 사람으로 이름을 날렸고 그 후에 
남편을 만나 결혼도 하게 되었습니다. 저는 자라면서 나가면 병신이라는 말을 많이 들었거든요. 제가 병신이라는 말을 들을 때는 그래도 괜찮았지만 시집가서 저희 딸을 낳았는데 사람들이 저희 딸 이름 대신 그 집의 병신의 딸 이렇게 할때제 진짜 가슴이 아팠거든요. 북한에는 장애인 지원을 전혀 하지 않습니다. 북한에 장애를 가지면 부모가 잘 살면 그들이 생도 길어지며 부모가 말서면 그들이 삶도 짧다고 생각하면 됩니다. 나라의 지원이 전혀 없고 경제적으로 어려운 음, 부모들은 장애인을 굶겨서 죽였다는 소리도 저는 들어는 봤는데 보지는 못하였습니다. 북한의 장애인 혜택이란 장애인인데 학교를 안 가는 거 봐주는 거 그리고 장애를 가졌으니까 나가서 일할 수 없잖아요. 너 일하러 나오라 이렇게 강요하는 게 북한의 장애인 혜택이라고 저는 생각합니다. 북한에서는 여자는 꽃이라는 선전이 있기는 하지만 일을 실감하지 못하고 있습니다. 시집간 후 육아는 무조건 여자의 몫이며 남자가 아이를 없는 것도 상상도 할수 없습니다. 남편이 없으면 여자는 무조건 일을 해야 합니다. 노동을 하지 않더라도 북한이 여맹조직에 여맹비를 내야 하고 토요일마다 가서 주체 세상에 대해 배워야 하고 자기 일주일 동안 무엇을 잘못했가 하는 걸 음, 비판하고 있습니다. 2000년대 후에는 여자는 배워서 뭐하냐 시집만 잘 가면 되지 라며 가정에서 학교를 보내지 않는 경우도 많았고요. 제가 북한에서 병신으로 불구로 살아오면서 거의 사람 취급받지 못하여 여성으로서의 저놈과 저놈에 대하여 생각해 본 적이 전혀 없습니다. 제가 북한에서 탈북하게 된 동기는 북한에서 병이 들면 병원에 가서 치료를 받는 것보다 집에서 약을 사서 개인이 주사를 놔주는 일이 많거든요. 근데 우리 동네 주사를 놔주는 분이 저 주사를 놔주고 저희 집 돈가방을 채갔던 거예요. 근데 그분이 보안사에 가서 자기가 쟀다고 증언을 했거든요. 근데 그 안에 돈을 다쓴 거예요. 근데 그러면 그 여자가 감옥을 가야 되는데 그그집 세대주가 그 돈을 물어주겠으니까 좀 살려달라 해서 저희 그걸 그러면 그렇게 해달라 하고 이해해줬거든요. 그런데 1년이 되더라 그 남편이 단돈 1전도 안 겠다 주는 거예요. 그래서 저희 세대주하고 그집 세대주가 왜 돈을 안 주냐 하고 신경이질하다가 싸움이 붙은 거예요. 근데 그분이 그다한 세막대기를 가져와서 제경막 달려와 가서 그걸 우리 세대주는 쳐서 여기에 맞고 나는 여기 경각거리에 불러줬거든요. 그래서 전 수술을 받게 되었습니다. 그런데 그분들이 자기가 잘못했으니까 북한 법에다 돈을 거인 거예요. 그러니까 북한에서는 내가 장애를 가지고 있기 때문에 너 스스로 넘어져서 경각거리 부러졌다고 하는 거예요. 너무나 그 유치원 아이들도 들으면 알수 있는 사실을 그분들은 제가 넘어졌다고 그러는 거예요. 거기에서 더는 살수 없다고 생각하고 2018년 6월에 저희 남편과 딸 해서 압록강을 건너서 여기로 오게 되었습니다. 저희는 압록강을 건너 중국, 베트남, 라오스, 태국을 거쳐 한국에 입국하였습니다. 남편은 저를 애기 포단에 싸서 얻고 딸이 손목을 잡고 압록강을 건넜습니다. 브로커들의 인도에 따라 차를 타고 중국 장백까지 갔고 장백에서 다시 기차를 타고 난닝까지 그리고 난닝에서 베트남, 베트남에서 태국 수경소까지 오게 되었으며 태국 수경소에서 한국 대사관이 덤으로 한국에 입국하게 되었습니다. 한국에서의 제 삶은 정말 꿈을 꾸는 것만 같습니다. 대학교를 다니고 자동차를 운전하며 직장에서 일도 하는 경험을 북한에서는 상상조차 할수 없는 일입니다. 대학을 다, 제가 대학을 다니지 못한 게 한이 되었는데 북한에서도 한국처럼 장애인도 대학을 다닐 수 있게 해줬으면 정말 좋겠습니다. 그리고 장애인 부모들이 자신이 자녀를 자랑스럽게 여기고 그들과 함께 안전한 환경에서 생활할 수 있도록 요청하고 싶습니다. 이 기회를 통해 국제사회가 
부족한 장애인들이 현실에 대해 알게 되고 이들이 동등한 사람으로서 존중받고 살았으면 하는 마음입니다. 북한 장애인들도 보통 사람들처럼 한국에 있는 장애인들처럼 자유롭게 선택하고 사랑하고 웃으며 살수 있었으면 정말 좋겠습니다. 감사합니다. 안녕하세요. 저는 두 차례 강제 북송을 당하고 2016년 자유를 찾아 대한민국에 입국한 지명희입니다. 저희 고향은 중국 장백현과 마주하고 있는 양강도의 한 시골 도시입니다. 그곳에서 팔남의 막내로 태어나 고등학교를 졸업하고 군 복무를 거쳐 고향에 돌아와 결혼하여 두 아들의 엄마가 되었습니다. 북한에서 고난의 행군을 하던 1996년 저희 남편은 병으로 사망하고 저는 6살, 4살 되는 두 아들을 키워야 하는 상황에 놓이게 되었습니다. 혼자 힘으로 애들을 키우자 하니 정말 못해본 일이었고 마지막에는 북한에서 단속하는 중국과의 개인 장사를 하면서 단속이 되어 6개월간씩 다섯 차례나 군노동 단련대에 끌려가 강제 노역을 당하였습니다. 이렇게 고생하며 한푼한푼 한푼 돈을 조금 모아놓으니 2009년 11월 30일 북한의 강제적인 합해 개혁을 실시하면서 쌀한톤 470kg를 살수 있는 돈을 빼앗아가고 그 다음 해에 돌려준 돈이 19kg를 살수 있는 돈을 전부였습니다. 온순히 자지도 못하고 먹지도 못하며 악착같이 모은 돈을 한순간에 다 빼앗기고 나니 더는 이 북한 땅에 대한 한멸로 살 수가 없어 2010년 7월 애들에게 한동안 먹을 수 있는 쌀과 돈을 장만해주고 엄마가 자리 잡고 데리러 온다는 약속을 남기고 탈북하게 되었습니다. 중국 장춘에서 한국행을 준비하던 중 중국 조선족이 밀고라 하여 2010년 10월 중국 국가안전위원회 사법경찰에 체포되어 3일 동안 무시무시한 의자에 앉혀놓고 잠도 자오지 않으면서 취소를 당한 후 3일 후에 백산 구류장으로 끌려갔습니다. 그곳은 중국 제수들이랑 같이 있는 구류장이었는데 감방은 따로따로 저희는 독감방에 갇혔습니다. 매일 옥수수 빵한 개에 점심은 옥수수 가루 풀을 주었고 경찰들은 매일같이 빨래를 시키고 어떤 경찰은 자기 집에 빨래를 가져다가 저희를 시키곤 하였습니다. 중국 제수들과 저희들은 차별적인 대우를 받으며 사람 취급을 받지 못하였습니다. 백산 구류장에서 한달 정도 있다가 우리를 북송시키기 위해 변방대 초소로 넘겨졌는데 그곳은 사람이 살 곳이 아니었습니다. 70일간 갇혀있는 동안 군인들이 꽤 항의하여 싸워가지고 세수를 딱한번할수 있었고 감방 안에 흐름한 바켓을 넣고 거기에 배설물이 다 차야 버릴 수 있어 감방 안은 악취로 냄새가 진동하였습니다. 매일 좀 배설물을 버리게 해달라고 들이대니 전기건봉을 가지고 돌아 저희들을 내리치고 하루에 변방대 군인들이 먹던 반찬들이 다 합쳐진 걸 한쪽 견이 넣고 밥을 한세 숟가락 정도 넣는 것이 하루에 한끼 혹은 두끼 주는 것이 전부였습니다. 너무도 내 처지가 비참하여 병원에 나가면 도망칠 수 있을까 해요. 한달 동안 모아둔 머리카락과 먼지들을 휴지종에 싸서 먹고 한참 뒤 배가 아파 군인들이 게 말했더니 들은 척도 하지 않고 철창문을 강 닫고 나가버려 약도 없이 이틀 동안 매우 아팠습니다. 간방에는 매일같이 어린 천의 애들이 들어와 울음소리가 거치지 않았고 군인들은 듣기 싫다고 전기건 봉을 들고 들어와 때리는 것이 한두 번이 아니었습니다. 중국에서 체포된 지약 3개월 만에 정치범들이 보내지는 북한 양강도 보위부 직결서에 강제 북송되었습니다. 여기 모이신 여러분들은 강제 북송이라는 이네 글자가 저희 탈북민들에게 얼마나 두려움이 대명사인지 잘 모르실 것입니다. 직결서에 도착하니 직결서 식당에서 일하는 아줌마를 데려다가 위생장갑도 없이 맨손으로 자궁에 손을 넣어 돈을 감추었는지 검사하고 
다리를 벌리고 뛰기를 시켜 돈을 감추었으면 떨어지게 하라고 소리쳤습니다. 다음 날부터 힘을 받았는데 한국과 연결거리가 있는 사람들은 가혹한 고문을 받아야 했습니다. 그들은 정말 사람이 아닌 괴물이었습니다. 손으로 귓밤을 얼마나 때렸는지 순간에 얼굴이 빵처럼 부풀어 오르고 자기 손바닥이 아프다고 구두를 가져다가 손을 넣고 구두로 얼굴을 사슴없이 때리고 가죽 혁띠로 때리고 몽둥이를 가져다가 팔다리를 얼마나 세게 때리는지 지금도 저희 다리에는 그 몽둥이 자리가 우묵하니 들어가 있습니다. 머리 옆을 얼마나 때리는지 한국의 입국에서도 머리 통증이 너무 심하여 2017년 병원에 가서 MRI를 찍어봤는데 선생님이 왜 머리 옆이 이렇게 움칸이 들어가 있는가 고 하여 제가 고문을 받아 그렇게 되었다고 말씀드렸습니다. 사람이라면 먹고 화성실이 가는 것은 인간의 원초적인 본능일 것입니다. 북한의 모든 감방에서는 화성실을 마음대로 갈 수가 없어 제가 감방에 있을 때만 해도 바지의 영변을 보는 기막힌 사건이 몇 차례나 있었습니다. 감방에서 말을 하다가 들키면 철장 앞에 나와 입을 벌리라 하고 그 사람 입이 침도 아닌 가래를 받아 사람이 입이 뺏어나는 인간으로서는 상상도 못할 만행들이 이사롭게 자행되고 있습니다. 이 시민들은 전문 고문을 배운 고문 기술자들이었습니다. 이 시민들이 눈알과 얼굴이 시뻘게 울기가 오르고 숨이 차흘떡거리면서 몽둥이를 들고 저희들을 때릴 때 정말 그들의 얼굴은 사람의 얼굴이 아니었습니다. 지금도 저는 그 무시무시한 얼굴을 잊을 수 없으며 트라우마로 공통을 겪고 있습니다. 정녕 살 수가 없어 살 길을 찾아 떠나온 것이 제가 된 것입니다. 감방 창문 앞에 커다란 나무가 있었는데 그게 참새들이 울음소리를 들으며 한 줌도 안 되는 그 참새가 부러워하던 어린 천의 영순이를 잊을 수 없습니다. 영순이, 은경이, 영란이, 정예 정말 얼마나 많은 어린 애들이 살기를 찾아 한국에 오려 했다는 죄로 정치범 서영서에 끌려갔습니다. 저는 50일간의 고문에도 한국에 가려 하지 않고 중국에서 돈을 벌어가지고 다시 고향에 오려 했다고 끝까지 우겨 정치범 수행소에 끌려가지 않고 보안국으로 넘겨져 개천교화소에서 교화생활을 마치고 나와 드디어 세 번째 탈북에 성공하여 2016년 대한민국에 입국하였으며 2019년에는 북한에 있는 두 아들을 목숨을 걸고 중국까지 가서 탈북시켜 지금은 서울에서 행복하게 살고 있습니다. 대한민국에 입국한 탈북민들이 3만 5천 명이라면 탈북이 성공하지 못하여 정치범 소행소에 끌려간 사람들은 그보다 몇 배나 더 많으며 그들은 지금도 인간 이하의 천대와 멸시, 학대와 고통 속에서 노역이 시달리고 한 많은 세상을 떠나고 있습니다. 나는 굶어 죽지 않고 살아보려고 한국에 가려 했다고 정말 하소연 한마디 빈번히 못하고 정치범 소행소에 끌려간 그 억울한 사람들을 대신해 국제사회의 북한의 실상을 알리고 강제 북송을 중단시킬 책임이 우리에게 있어 이렇게 용기를 내어 세계에 고발하려고 나왔습니다. 지금까지 제가 말씀드린 것은 우리가 겪은 북한의 인권 상황에 대한 아주 작은 한 부분에 지나지 않습니다. 이런 비참한 현실을 알면서도 수많은 탈북자들을 잡아 북한에 강제 북송시키는 중국 정부의 비인도주의적인 행위에 대하여 강력히 규탄합니다. 중국 정부는 얼마 전에도 600여 명의 탈북민들을 강제 북송시키고 또다시 많은 탈북민들을 강제 북송시키려고 하고 있습니다. 중국 정부의 이런 비인도주의적인 행위는 당장 멈춰져야 합니다. 오늘 이 자리에 함께하신 여러분들과 세계의 많은 양심들이 힘을 합쳐 다시는 이런 비인도주의적인 행위가 일어나지 않게 우리 인권운동에 국제적인 관심과 지지와 성원을 보내주실 것을 간곡히 호소드립니다. Thank you very much. Thank you, Myungi Ji, for your invincible spirit and strength. Thank you very much.